here, Professor Markovic. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real treat to be here. So for our first question, we'll start off by that many of us believe that our current system is based around merit. Could you explain merit for us? Sure. So the basic feature, the central feature of meritocracy is that people get ahead or get advantage in their own lives, not on the basis of some kind of immediately inherited privilege, their race, their caste, their class, their parents, but instead on the basis of their own achievements and accomplishments, where their achievements and accomplishments could be measured in a variety of ways. So for example, under the Confucian meritocracy in China, achievements and accomplishments were related to a certain form of erudition in literature, classical texts, and the ability to perform well on certain exams. In our meritocracy today, in Europe, in the United States, achievement and accomplishment are measured by some combination of being good at school and then being able to do jobs that the market values very highly. So being able to do work that at least when measured by how much it's paid is deemed very productive. Okay, so only after 1962 at Yale Law School where you work, admissions were starting to be based on merit instead of where you came from, from your family. Um, this was a shift from an aristocracy to a meritocracy. Could you take us through this change? Why did this happen? Sure, so this happened uh, over a period of time, at least in the US, in almost all of the elite institutions. Um, you know, in the 19th century, elite institutions were peopled exclusively, were filled exclusively with the children of other members of elites. And then over the course of the 20th century, those institutions started opening up and uh, they started replacing admission as of right based on who your parents were. And in those days, these were all male institutions. So it was with admission based on a competition where the competition involved how well you did at your schools and at various tests that were administered nationally. Um, Yale actually became a meritocracy later than many of the other elite universities. Harvard became a meritocracy earlier, um, but partly because Yale came so late, it was also very sudden. And there was a conscious decision by the president of Yale University in the early 1960s to transform who got into Yale so that it was no longer the sons of privileged people simply because of who their fathers were. And instead it was people who did well in high school, did well on tests and competed their way in as it were. And that happened at Yale over the course really of five years, the institution was transformed in response to this. But the, what happened at Yale had parallels in the US at Harvard, at Princeton, at other elite institutions. It had parallels in the UK at Oxford and Cambridge. It in fact has had parallels on the European continent, uh, you know, at, at the, the great Parisian, the great French universities at Grand Ecoles in Germany. And we should talk eventually about how the early promise of meritocracy didn't pay out. But in the early years, it really was a massive opening up of access to privilege to people who didn't have privileged backgrounds, but just were able to win at this competition. All right, let's, let's talk about this start of meritocracy. Um, you, we mentioned elite institutions, Yale, Harvard, universities itself. Um, was this a precursor to pushing it in the entire society? Or was it a combination that it, like, was it a, a signal or was it a cause of it? I think it was both. So at least, you know, in the, in the US, in the post-war, years for a variety of reasons um, relating to competition with the Soviet Union, relating to the civil rights movement, relating to the opening up of uh, institutions to Jews and to Catholics. For all of these reasons, there was a growing perception in the broader society that the old aristocratic U.S. American elite, which was white, male, and Protestant overwhelmingly, was closed in, confined, uh, people sometimes said sclerotic, that is to say very rigid, not able to be very effective, and that the demands both of geopolitical competition and of internal domestic politics and justice 
required that this elite open itself up and that people who were historically excluded simply on the basis of who they were, were given access. And one of the things that meritocracy did for reformers is it simultaneously provided a much juster way of selecting the elite. Because after all, no subgroup has a monopoly on talent, energy, virtue, effort. And it also, so the reformers said, would create an elite that was more capable. Because if you selected based on achievement, you get a more achievement powerful elite. And so it was both just and prudent. And that was the, the core argument in favor of meritocracy between say in America 1950 and 1970 or something like that. And there would have been similar movements in other countries around the world. So around the 60s, we got the start of this great system of the seemingly great system of meritocracy. Um, in, from the 70s onwards, there's also a rise of neoliberalism. Um, how do you see the link between neoliberalism and meritocracy? Yeah, great. So, so I'd say that there are two kinds of links. Um, the first is that you know, neoliberalism, for all of the criticisms that have been waged against it, especially on the left, is a form of liberalism. That is to say, it, it is opposed to hereditary caste, formal types of racial exclusion, formal types of gender hierarchy, formal types of religious bigotry, because it's deeply committed to the idea of the individual. And in that way, meritocracy and neoliberalism fit nicely together. So that's, that's one connection. The other connection is that neoliberalism measures the individual in a very particular way, namely according to her value on the market, where the market is constructed by governments and power to look a certain way, the way we've seen a highly financialized economy, management being a very important skill and concentrated in an elite, all of these sorts of trends. And what meritocracy became in the United States, especially, but increasingly also in Europe, is that it became a system whose measure of merit looked to the market. So if you ask, you know, what is it that the most accomplished students and graduates go do? Well, they go into the jobs that pay the most. So would you say this neoliberalistic system corrupted meritocracy? I don't think that it's fair to say that meritocracy was obviously a pure and virtuous system and that neoliberalism came from the outside and corrupted it. And, but if you look- I would, to, just just, just, just to, to finish the thought, I would say instead that meritocracy and neoliberalism mutually reinforced each other. And there's a way in which meritocracy also made liberalism into neoliberalism. So they they, increase the power and also the corruption of each of them. And if you compare it to other modes of capitalism, so a more European system, more German system, social democratic model, um, you see differences in the size of meritocracy. Is that purely the acceptance of neoliberalism or not? No, I don't think it's, it, I mean, purely uh, <clears throat> would be too strong in, in, in any event. And neoliberalism is complicated enough that I'm not sure it's one thing. Um, here's what I think. So Germany, for example, is a very interesting case because um, on the one hand, Germany has relatively less income inequality than say a country like the United States. On the other hand, wealth inequality in Germany is enormous. And um, hereditary privilege in Germany is enormous. It just, it doesn't run through schooling. It doesn't run through the labor market. It runs through the ownership of mid-size firms, the Deutsche Mittelstand. So it, it runs through the ownership of companies uh, that are passed down through the generations. And, and interestingly, for example, Germany for all of its social democracy um, has one of the loosest and least um, high rate based inheritance tax regimes in Europe, so that it's possible for German families that own these businesses to pass them down through the generations without the states taxing them away. 
So, so it's a very complicated relationship between meritocracy and inequality and neoliberalism. And there are other forms of stratification and inequality that endure in many places. Let's go back to the, the United States system. Uh, a big part of neoliberalism, as you mentioned it, what the market values uh, gets a certain like, valuation, uh, and that's how it determines it. Um, a big part is that there's inequality in the neoliberal system. Would you say that meritocracy is a sort of moral justification of that inequality? So, so mer yeah, so meritocracy is both a cause and then purports to be a justification. So let's let's take a look at the U.S. and finance. Um, today, finance is incredibly highly paid in the U.S. It's one of the highest paid sectors of the economy, and elite finance workers are dominated by graduates of a very small number of super elite universities. So finance is super highly paid and super educated in the United States. In 1960, that wasn't true. Finance in 1960 was a middle class industry. Now, what happened to produce the transformation? Well, what happened was that a new elite workforce transformed how finance does its function, changing the technologies of finance, for example, inventing and then implementing securitization and the massive use of derivatives, changing the relationship between finance and what economists call the real economy, that is to say the part of the economy that actually makes and delivers goods and services, so the market for corporate control was created. This is the market that gives outside investors the ability to take over firms, get rid of management and replace it with new management. So when the financial systems that allow that kind of a move, say the leverage buyout to occur, exist, then the returns to finance go way up because finance can start doing things that it couldn't do previously. Similarly, elite workers transform the legal regime that governs finance and management to enable other elite workers to do aggressive styles of finance and management that have a very high rate of return. So what's going on here is that meritocracy and the creation and privileging of a super elite set of highly skilled workers transform social and economic systems in ways that privilege and benefit precisely those same workers. And then it claims, and this is the moral justification part, that those workers deserve their enormously high pay because they're so valuable and productive. But of course, the only reason why they're so valuable and productive is that they have transformed the system in their own image to value precisely what they offer. So there's a kind of a moral circle that's being committed. And that's what meritocracy doesn't sufficiently recognize. So you just touched upon that most people working in these finance jobs come from Ivy League schools. So in your famous book, which is called The Meritocracy Trap, you talk about examples where we see a shift back from aristocracy to, um, from meritocracy to aristocracy in universities, where um, there are admission scandals with parents sometimes paying over a million dollars to get their children into Ivy League universities. Why do parents pay this much? And could you tell us perhaps the secret about what happens behind these doors that makes it worth a million dollars? Sure, so, so let me just um, say a little bit more about the facts behind these scandals um, and, then, and then I'll move on to the question. Um, one thing that's very important to understand about US American universities, elite universities, which is very different from Europe, is that there are a series of ways in which they are fundamentally corrupt. That is to say, they accept donations from alumni. Um, being an alumnus increases the chance that your child will get in. Giving a large donation as an alumnus further increases the chance that your child will get in. And all of those forms of corruption are officially allowed. They're perfectly permissible. What made the scandals you're talking about scandals and forms of illegal corruption is that the universities did not capture the proceeds of their own corruption. So these are cases in which rich parents paid other people to lie to the universities about their children, to get their children in. If they had simply paid the universities, it would have been legal. 
That's the striking thing about the United States. The problem is they would have had to pay the universities more than they had to pay the other people. Okay, so that's the that's the system in which this corruption scandal entered. Why is it that parents are willing to do this? Parents are willing to do this because the social and economic benefits to a child of attending these universities are so enormously high. Um, so you know, a firm like Goldman Sachs effectively recruits at a very small number of universities, five, eight, nine, something like that. And a firm like Goldman Sachs pays enormously high wages to its workers. The first year they're there, and even more as they rise their way up through the hierarchy. Um, in law, for example, a graduate of one of the most elite law schools can expect to make $200,000 her first year on the job market. There's a law firm in America whose profits per partner is over $6 million now each year. So partners at that firm average $6 million a year. And something like 85% of the partners at that firm attended only 10 law schools. So that explains why parents want their children to go. And the scandal you're talking about was just the subset of parents who resorted to something illegal to get their kids in, as opposed to the broader set of parents who exploited legal forms of privilege and corruption to get their kids in. And then the even broader set of parents who simply sent their children to excellent private schools, paid for additional tutors, helped their children with homework, and those kids also in some ways are getting in based on corruption. Because if you're not rich, your kids can't go to those schools. It's just, this is meritocratic corruption. So that's the, the, uh, that's the, was gonna be our next question that uh, the middle and lower classes, uh, you have an incredible stat in your book that there are more people from the 0.1% uh, at Yale or at least elite universities compared to the bottom 75 and bottom 60%. Uh, so, so that's so you slightly overstated it. At, oh. at Yale, Harvard, Princeton, and Stanford, there are more kids whose parents are in the top one percent than so, in the bottom sixty percent. I'm happy to be corrected. Uh, yeah. um, what behind that mer meritocratic system? What other mechanisms are in place yeah. that stop this from happening? Yeah. So so let's let's start with public schools. Um, in almost all rich countries, in all but three OECD countries public schools spend more money per year on every poor student than on every rich student. So public school financing funds education that invests more in kids whose parents aren't rich than in kids whose parents are rich. In the United States, the reverse is true. In the United States, in public schools, much more money is spent per year on rich children than on poor children. A really, really rich public school district in the United States might spend three times as much on a child each year as a poor district. So public schooling already is massively skewed towards the rich. And that money obviously buys education. It buys smaller class sizes. It buys better teachers. It buys computers and labs and school books. Private schools in the United States spend even more and even more and more. So if you look at the 20 most elite private schools in America, at least as measured by Forbes magazine, they spend on average $75,000 per pupil per year educating the kids who go there. The national public school average is twelve dollars to $15,000. So they're spending five or six times as much per pupil per year as an average public school and six to eight times as much as a poor public school. And that education, all that expenditure, produces kids who've learned more. Because obviously, if much more is invested in educating you, the academic results will be better. And so when a school like Harvard admits students based on merit, so to speak, based on how good their grades are, how much they know, how they do on national tests, the kids who have the most merit are gonna be the kids who have the most intensive education. And the kids who have the most intensive education are gonna be the kids who went to the fanciest private schools and public schools. 
And those kids themselves are going to be the children of rich parents. Because so the private schools, school exactly, the, the private thing. schools are so expensive that only rich people can afford to send them. Right. And the public schools that spend so much money are located in very rich neighborhoods where you have to be incredibly rich to buy a house. If we talk about, um, this is a vicious circle, it's impossible to escape almost. Um, in your book was written in 2019, last year we got the introduction to online education. What is the influence of online education at this, uh, at these, of these mechanisms? Yeah, so um, I have some data about this in the United States. I, I'm actually putting together a, a group of people that, that's uh, working on exactly this question. Online education has made this worse, not better. Um, first of all, richer schools in the pandemic have been much less likely to turn to online education. So in the United States, at the start of this last school year, the majority of public school kids were online only. But the majority of private school kids were going in person. And that's because private schools made enormous investments in order to make it possible to go safely in person. So like two uh, vaccination tests a week. So for example, universities at Yale University, all the students get tested twice a week, but at private high schools, students get tested every week. So there are private high schools that have bought testing machines or entered into contracts with labs to test all their students. And these schools have also changed their heating, air conditioning, and vacuuming systems to filter out microparticles. They've put in place forms of social distancing, all sorts of regimes so that you can go in person. So the first thing that's happened is that online education has been overwhelmingly the way in which middle class and working class and poor Americans are getting their education and rich Americans are still going in person. But the second thing is just one more thing on this, Online education is enormously more effective for rich people than for people who are less rich. Because to do online education well, you need three things. Obviously, you need a computer and broadband. That's not free. But the other two things are much more expensive still. You need small class sizes. It's much easier for one teacher to teach six children online than 40. Because with six, even online, the teacher can give individualized attention. And then the third thing you need, which is really the most expensive, is you need quiet, safe, calm places at home for the children to work. And for a rich family where every child has their own bedroom and there may be a couple of guest rooms or studies in the house and the parents are still employed and the parents are themselves educated and can help with the schooling, Online schooling is not fun, but it's perfectly effective. But for a middle class, working class or poor family, where there's one room that everybody has to be in at once, the parents are struggling to meet their own financial obligations. And the parents themselves don't have the education they need to be substitute teachers for their children. Online education doesn't work very well. And so the move online has made these differences bigger, not smaller. But on the long term, the accessibility, uh, I could from my own bedroom can follow Yale courses, Harvard courses, all those elite institutions, I can access them um, as a general yeah. Dutch student. Wouldn't on the long term, the access to all the information not help or like alleviate the divide of it? So the, the evidence so far cuts against that conclusion. You, you would think so, but, but, but if you look at who accesses those classes, it's overwhelmingly white, middle and upper middle class and privileged people. So it, it turns out that the people who make use of that are also those who already have the most privilege. And there are a series of reasons for that. Some of those are the ones I just described. You need, you need the room, you need the time, you need the computer. But, but the other thing about this is um, there, there's an American football coach actually originated with an American baseball player who said, practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. And, and the point is this, in order to get something from watching a class like this online, you have to have already been taught 
enormous amounts about how to learn, how to set yourself exercises, how to interact with texts, how to get feedback on your work. And what elite education does is it teaches all of those skills in an intensive way by performing them, by doing them. And simply watching somebody else get an education is not the same thing as getting an education yourself. And we have not yet figured out how to use technology to produce perfect practice. That's an incredibly labor-intensive, individualized thing. Clearly, and unfortunately, this is not a perfect meritocracy. But if we would imagine a perfect meritocracy where everyone has equal opportunity, where everyone has exactly the same start, would that be a utopia? Would that be perfect? So this is, I think, the hardest, the hardest part of the critique of meritocracy that I'm making really to take home, which is this. There are two senses in which a perfect meritocracy of the sort you describe is impossible. One of them is conceptual, one of them is empirical. The conceptual one is that we don't know what merit is apart from the system that evaluates it. So that remember we talked about the relation between meritocracy and neoliberalism. So what meritocracy has done is it's produced inequality, but also produced a system in which what counts as merit is how much the market will pay you. So there are lots and lots of jobs out there that are very valuable jobs, but the market doesn't pay a lot. There was a study, for example, done by some English economists that discovered if you're a teacher or a home healthcare worker or a nurse, or for that matter, a garbage collector, society gets 10 pounds of social product for every pound in wages that you get. So the market pays you only one tenth of your economic contribution to society. But if you're a financier, a banker, or a lawyer, you get more than one pound in wages for every pound of social product you produce. So the market doesn't value things in the right way. And that's one problem already, even with the meritocracy that is well implemented. The second problem is empirical, which is that if you have inequality of outcomes that gets big enough, the quality of opportunity is impossible. What will always happen is that people who do really well themselves will use their advantage to benefit other people who are close to them. Parents love their children. And so when you get inequality of outcomes that are very, very large, the way in which parents behave towards their children means you will not have a quality of opportunity. Would it be something to strive for, to try to create this as best as possible? So, so I think both of those problems are so profound that the answer is no. That instead, what we should strive for is a system with meaningful equality of opportunity and a system that rewards people for doing things well, for excellence, but that does not have built into it the competitive features, the push for superiority that meritocracy inevitably has. Now let's keep focusing on this push for uh, perfection. Um, you graduated summa cum laude from Yale, went to Oxford, studied there, went back to Yale Law School. Uh, to us, you seem like the ultimate meritocrat, a winner of the system, or are we wrong to say that? You know, I, I think you're certainly not wrong to say that I am part of the problem that I'm describing. Um, We're not that harsh. But, in a, but, but I think it's true. I mean, in, 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 a, in at least two really important ways. One is I'm a product of it. Um, you know, in, insofar as I have the platform I do or I have the job that I do, it's because I turned out to be good at taking tests. So in that sense, I'm a product of it. And I'm now also an agent of it in that when I teach my students, I increase their privilege. Um, and, and I think it's important to acknowledge that because it's important to understand that the book that I've written is not meant to be persuasive on account of who I am. I mean, I'm inside this system and uh, you know, as both 
shaped by it and culpable as anyone. Instead, if the book is persuasive, it's meant to be persuasive because it reports a series of facts and makes a series of arguments that stand apart from its author. And either when you read them, you think, yeah, this is, this is true, or you think it's not. Um, but no part of it is meant to be <clears throat> that I, I have some position to be testifying. That, that's not what I'm trying to do precisely for the reason you give, which is that I'm implicated. I'm not a reliable witness. So it's a above helicopter view of the problem without you as an individual in the pro like you don't write it as yourself, you write it as a helicopter view looking at the problem. Yeah. Um, we talked about the winners of the system, uh, the people that go get 10 dollars for every one dollar of social product they give. Um, your Ivy League students or the Yale students, um, they put in so they put in a lot of work to become the winners, but would you say they're also suffering under this meritocratic system? Well, look, I think we need to distinguish um, two kinds of hardship. Um, there's political hardship and there's existential hardship. Political hardship is the kind of hardship that gives other people a reason to do something to make your situation better. So a lot of people are excluded from meaningful work. Their kids can't go to the schools that they need to go to or they want to go to on account of meritocracy and meritocratic inequality. That's political hardship. And that gives the rest of society a reason to change how jobs are allocated, how schools operate in order to give meaningful opportunity to people who are now excluded. The elite does not have any political hardship. There's no reason for anybody else in society to care about the trouble of the elite or to do anything different to make life easier for the elite. But then there's existential hardship. And existential hardship comes from the fact that everybody has only one life to live, that we are limited in our capacity and our freedoms, and we're all stuck in the position we're in, even the most privileged. And what meritocracy does for the privileged is to impose a kind of existential hardship. And the reason why is the following. Um, being, there are two reasons. One is that being born rich is almost a necessary condition for getting ahead. Because if you're not rich, you're not going to get the fancy education that you need to get ahead. But it's not a sufficient condition because the competition at the top is so intense that even if you have the fancy education, you may not get ahead. And so the rich are constantly competing, constantly being measured, constantly wondering whether they'll get admitted. Stanford University admits fewer than 5% of its applicants. Um, a really, really elite bank or law firm partners only a small share of its associates. And so there's constant competition at the top, and that's stressful and awful. Do these and then students the second thing is, realize this is incredibly stressful. They're going to put in 100 week hours. Do they realize their future and current hardship? I think that, well, I mean, so yes, they all know that this is what's happening, and they all know that this is what's happened to them. Um, why, don't, why don't they act on it? Why don't? So there are two kinds of reasons. Um, the first is, maybe there are three kinds of reasons. The first is it's not clear what their alternatives are. Um, this is a system of competition in which if you drop out, you can fall pretty far. So that the alternative, which is the one that people might want, which is a comfortable, still privileged, but less privileged existence in which you maintain your freedom isn't really available. It's either constant competition 100 hours a week or enter a precarious middle class. And neither of those is such an appealing alternative. So that's one reason. Another reason is that the people have internalized the norms and values produced by their form of life and practice by the time they get to me. So that, you know, it, you can know that a system is not a good system and yet be unable to escape its judgments in your own mind. 
Um, and then the third is one thing that happens through going through this system is that you lose other interests. You lose the kinds of values, ballasts, projects that would give you meaning without meritocracy. Um, here's a, a casual piece of empiricism. When, when I talk to elite lawyers, when I talk to those who are you know, 70 to 90, the oldest generation, they all have hobbies. They all have hobbies. When I talk to elite lawyers in their 30s and 40s, none of them has hobbies. Because the 70 to 90 year olds reached their jobs and their positions under the previous regime in which you could get to the top without having to compete all the time. And so they had space left in their lives. Whereas the 30 to 50 year olds reached the top in this regime in which the only way they could get there is by excluding everything from their life except this competition. And once that's all you know, even if it makes you existentially unwell, you have no place to go to free yourself from it. So if it's only getting more competitive and people are constantly working harder and spending days and nights working, how sustainable is this? Like, How can the elite keep this going? Or will this burst at some moment? I think it's. I think it is starting to burst. I think one way in which to understand the explosion of populism is as a combination of middle class anger and resentment at this system of exclusion and elite disenchantment. The elite no longer has the courage of its own convictions. And so you have the the rebellion against the system is growing and the people in the control of the system no longer believe in it themselves. And, and when those two things happen at the same time, the system becomes unstable. And that's what we're seeing. But if we look at the other side of the meritocratic system, we see that there is an elite created that is highly driven, super intelligent, and can actually be useful in our society. Right now we're facing constant crises like the financial crisis, COVID crisis, and the coming climate crisis. Yeah. Aren't they super helpful to combat these crises? Well, they're helpful in one way and harmful in another. Um, so let's start about the way in which they're harmful. Um, the financial crises, and, and I view the financial crisis as ongoing. It wasn't confined to 2007, 2008. Um, because there's an ongoing move towards financialization, towards the destruction of, of, of long-term employment, towards a shift to control away from workers and towards financiers and so on. That crisis is driven by elite skill. It's precisely because the elites are so good at being bankers that these crises happen, because they're so good at capturing returns for themselves at stripping assets away from other groups of people, at replacing self-governance in the real economy with financialized control in the financial markets. So here, it's precisely the skill of the elites that's causing the problem. Now, let's look at the pandemic as another instance. Here, the situation is a little more complicated. On the one hand, it's precisely the skill of the elites that has made the creation of vaccines so quickly possible. So that's a sense in which the meritocratic elite is really performing a great social good. On the other hand, on the other hand, we are having many of the problems of public health, of epidemiological disease control, of failure to social distance, of mask hesitancy, of vaccine resistance that we are having in many of our societies because of the stratification, the lack of democratic participation, the lack of democratic accountability that meritocratic inequality produces. And you know, it's an interesting thing that if you look at the countries that have managed really to control the pandemic, without the vaccine. These are all countries that have not been able to produce a vaccine. 
So if you look at the countries that have the elite that can produce the vaccine, the United States, the United Kingdom, Russia, these are countries that also have been unable to use the democratic method of public health to control the pandemic. So here the elite I think is both very much to be credited for saving us, but the forms of stratification that created the elite that can now save us have made it much harder for us to save ourselves. But how could we put, is there a way to have these elites doing more socially valuable jobs and getting these positions? Or do you think they will always stay in finance as long as the money is there? So I think there are things we can do. We can um, re-regulate certain key parts of our economy in ways that reduce the private returns to being in them. So finance is a key example. Um, many interventions such as a return to the separation of investment and commercial banking, such as a financial transactions tax, such as substantial limits on exploitative forms of consumer financial transactions, such as changing in the changes in the ways in which home mortgages are constructed to prevent the massive securitization of home mortgages and the inflation of housing bubbles. Those kinds of changes would all make finance simultaneously more socially productive and less privately profitable for bankers. And if finance were less privately profitable for bankers, more bankers would go into some other line of business. People who are very skilled would become instead engineers or doctors or certain kinds of lawyers. And we could redistribute human talent in a way that would make talent and training more socially productive. And that though there are policies we could imagine that would do that. To focus more on the, the, the Wall Street, last week there was an innovation in Wall Street, uh, the GameStop stock rally well, from the Reddit platform. Is this an example of uh, the middle class taking a bit back from the elites or is it just a one-time uh, event? Well, we'll see whether it's a one-time event or not. Um, I don't think it's an example of the middle class taking things back from the elites. It, it is an example of populist anger taking aim at a certain subset of the elite, namely the, the hedge fund short sellers of this stock. Um, a lot of middle-class people are gonna lose a lot of money as a result of that bubble. That is to say, this stock is not actually worth its current price or isn't worth what its price was three days ago. And many unsophisticated people bought in while the bubble was inflated. <laughs> and are gonna lose a lot of money. So, so you know, I think I understand and I have sympathy with the idea that lots of ordinary investors should take on you know, big concentrations of capital and beat them, but they're beating themselves too, to some degree. And I, I, don't, I don't know that it's such a great model. It, it's a great model of anger, but I don't know it's such a great model of reform. Well, let me not talk about reform, but more about the response of it from last week, because on all the, the journalistic media, CNBC, Wall Street Journal, they were all incredibly critical of it, rightly so, because it is going to be a bubble. But is it not just the elites trying to hedge themselves in um, to protect themselves, saying this is terrible, this is wrong, you shouldn't do this? Well, I think there may be some of that. Um, and certainly uh, when you know the big Wall Street insiders were critical, I think we should assume that that was a form of self-dealing. Um, but, but I also think, look, there's a difference between the will of the people and the will of the mob. And one of the differences is that the will of the people is constructed and regulated and developed discursively and through deliberation in such a way that it actually over the long term benefits the people whose will it is. And the kinds of outpourings of anger that we're seeing and you know the 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 bubble you're talking about is an example but so also are a series of other populist eruptions in politics 
the QAnon conspiracy, also an example of people who are excluded and alienated and angry, expressing anger. But it's important that we have the institutions and the social forms and practices so that that anger can be expressed in a way that can sustain itself productively and benefit the people whose anger it is. So the, talking like this could be, uh, is this one of your solutions to get out of the, the, the social mobility meritocracy trap to make them forces more heard of the middle class? Um, well, sure, I think, so one solution is a massive investment in middle class and working class education. So massively increasing what's invested in educating most people and decreasing what's invested in educating elites, diluting elite education by opening it up to more people. So creating a more egalitarian education system would be very important here. And, and it would change the labor market and change the jobs that people go into. And you know, if you had a more equal education system, you would have less wage inequality and then in the next generation down, you would have a still more equal education system because there wouldn't be the unequal wages that fund the unequal education for the children. So trying to create an upward cycle to say that. Up, exactly, yeah. a, a virtuous self-reinforcing cycle between school and work, whereas now we have a vicious self-reinforcing cycle between school and work. In the Netherlands right now, the Minister of Education has announced that in highly competitive studies like medicine, students that are good enough can enter a lottery system. So it's not based on merit, but it's based on a lottery, a bit like your colleague Michael Sandel said in his book. Yeah. Um, do you think that's a good solution also for the USA? So uh, look, uh, it might be better than what we have. Um, we, we don't have experience with lotteries that determine something that important it would be interesting to see in the Netherlands what, what happens, how stable the lottery is, whether people find a way to game it or cheat it. The reason why I raise these possibilities is that a better solution would be enormously to increase the number of spaces in those fields. And you know, if we increase the number of spaces in those fields, one thing that would happen is the wages and the social status of being a doctor or being a lawyer would go down. And then there'd be less competition to get in, you know? And look, we have this problem, America, the US is the most extreme version of this. In the US, there is service after service after service where some people get way too much of it and other people get way too little of it. But don't you think that can also cause a system where we have too many high skilled uh, people in and that are just not enough professions um, so I, that this is why I, this is why I said this. This I'm not so worried about that yet. So think about law and medicine. Okay, um, you know if you're really rich, you have access to endless numbers of lawyers. But if you're not just poor but also middle class, you never have your you never have a lawyer because you can't afford a lawyer. And you know try getting a divorce as a working class person, you, you know, to hire a lawyer to manage a divorce intelligently costs tens of thousands of euros. But if you're working class, your household assets may be only 40,000 euros, all told. And you're gonna spend a half of everything you own to manage the distribution of what you own? No, of course not. So you don't have adequate access to lawyers. Similarly, with respect to doctors, if you're rich, you can get doctors to do thousands of tests on you that you don't need and that don't benefit your health. But if you're poor or middle class, you don't get enough doctor time. And so with respect to doctors, wouldn't it be great if there were so many doctors that every patient got a half hour consultation with the doctor every time? Oh, definitely. I mean, that would be very great, of course. Uh, that's right. And so if we had more doctors, way. that's what they would do. Yeah. And, and they provide better medicine. Okay, so we've already arrived at our final question. And that is a more personal question. 
because for me as a student, I still have this intuition that when I get higher grades, when I work harder, I also get a better job and eventually a better future. Would you argue that we should just get rid of this feeling or how do I as a student escape this meritocracy trap? Yeah, so the reason why I, I say it's a trap is that um, you can't escape it one person at a time. So, you know, if, if you're a student and you, you don't work hard and you don't get good grades, um, your employment prospects go way down and the risk that you'll join the precariat goes way up. And being in the precariat is not nice. So uh, obviously if you're not even a student, if you're in the sense that you're excluded from university studies, you're confined to the precariat already. And so you're in trouble. But even if you're the person who could get into the elite, the alternative of, of joining or rejoining the precariat is not an appealing one. And so there's no individualized escape. I think what they're, the best an individual can do is management. That is to say, um, when you are offered something that is shiny, that looks like it's exclusive, that looks like if you really work hard, you might get it and then you'll be superior to others for having gotten it. Always ask yourself, how does this thing fit into an actually valuable life for me? And, you know, so let me give you a very concrete example. I have a former student, um, you know, who could have gotten a job at one of the most elite and competitive law firms in New York where you know, her salary, as I said, first year would have been $200,000. If she'd worked really, really hard within 10 years, she'd be making two or $3 million a year. Um, she chose instead to get a job at a law firm in Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is famous for its democratic internal organization for lack of internal hierarchy. And you know, when she took that job, she took a lifetime pay cut of maybe 70%. You know, she's going to make a lot less money and she won't be on the deal book pages of the Wall Street Journal. And when she dies, there won't be an obituary of her in the New York Times. On the other hand, she gets to work in a culture that is welcoming. She works fewer hours, she gets to control who her clients are, and she'll make enough money to lead a comfortable existence in the place where she lives. Now, the problem is not everybody can do that. There aren't enough jobs of that sort. If there were, we wouldn't be in the trap. But as an individual, you can still look for opportunities like that places where you know you give up something and what you give up is real but it's not nearly as big as what you gain and and to keep that in mind is the best advice i can give well i think that's a personal a perfect story to end this interview with thank a lot for your uh, responses we both enjoyed the interview very much um yes thank you i've had a lovely time talking and um you know i very much hope we are uh, in, in the UK and on the continent most summers. So perhaps our paths can cross in person sometime. That would be a treat. That Hopefully. Would be fantastic. Uh, for our audience, next week, we'll have an interview with Matthew Klein on his book, How Trade Wars Are Class Wars. Uh, it's going to be very, uh, a very interesting interview. So come check that out. Uh, I, wanna... I highly recommend it. It's an excellent book. Excellent book. All right. And I also have to add it to the reading list. Uh, thank you a lot for your uh, attention for this interview and I hope we'll see the audience soon in the real life at Yuva Rudas Island building.